Good afternoon, everybody. Respected dignitaries on the dais and everybody sitting on the auditorium and uh, young friends. It is the first time I am coming to this Petrocol Congress and I am really thrilled uh, the way it is conducted, the quality of the papers read and moreover the meticulous planning which has gone into making this a big success by Dr. Anil Garg and uh, Mrs. Ragini Garg and their team for their absolute uh, cooperation, hospitality and the way they have been behaving. I mean, it's my first experience, though I have attended several conferences, not only here abroad. Uh, they had a very, very Indian touch to the whole things. Thank you, Dr. Anil Garg and Ragini Garg. Yeah, there are several things which uh, stands out in my mind and I would like to say a few things as uh, observations and comments. It's like uh, taking a sumptuous meal and your stomach becomes overfilled and you find a discomfort so that you are not able to move freely. I am in that sort of a mind. My mind is full of the thoughts and ideas which has come over this conference. And uh, my what to say, what to think, the whole thing is stagnating in my mind. Uh, but I would like to pinpoint a few things. Petro coal, yes, petroleum, coal and gas. So many ideas has come, like uh, synergy of energy, energy mix, sustainability and uh, harmonious, being harmonious with the nature. Don't try to disturb the equilibrium which is already existing. And there are so many examples where the nature has retaliated. Uh, so, out of the several presentations which has struck me is the work being done by ONGC uh, in the field of gas. We have to increase gas production and uh, I think as a country we should and the government and the industrialists and investors are all with a single dedicated determination and objective that we should increase our gas production. So the gas hydrates things which you talked about and the shale gas which is there in, in the country, at least shale rocks are there in the country and the bio CBM which is talked about. These are all tremendous source of gas. So what stops us from going ahead with a separate group of people dedicated to get this done for the country? When you say 10 years and we should make it, in 10 years this gas should be flowing through the pipelines. And if that sort of a determination is there, I think it will happen and things will change. And in that I will add bio CBM also. This is very close to my heart. What I am saying is, people think that bio CBM is, that means bio CBM means a CBM gas is exhausted. So the policy says that uh, we have to surrender the gas blocks back. Why not convert that gas carbon lying underground to gas through bio process? Don't take it lightly because all gas productions are through bio means. What natural gas we are taking is a result of bio process underground. And all the thing which is happening in the world is a bio process. So bio process is a natural process. And people say it is impossible thinking that this is a one reactor, the process is very slow. So what sort of gas production we can get? 
No, underground is an inexhaustible source. The reactor is so huge. Even by the slow process, the gas production should be considerable. But it is not readily com available for commercialization. People have to do certain R&D work. And ONGC, I understand ONGC has already done some work in this. They have put the nutrients and they have put the bugs underground and now they are waiting for the gas to come out. And things is going to change. That is one thing which I would like to say then. Renewables, yes, there was a lot of talk on renewables. But one area has been totally neglected. That is also close to my heart. Everywhere I go, I talk about it. This country is facing one of the most severe problems of municipal solid waste. Bombay produces around 10,000 tons per day. I think Delhi also might be producing a similar thing. All towns and cities in this country producing municipal solid waste. There is no definite technology being used to convert that municipal solid waste into gas. Can you imagine the amount of gas which can be produced? There may be so many objections coming in the process, how to do it, how to collect it, how to bring it, uh, how do you segregate it. All these are problems in the way to say that we don't want to see it, we don't want to look at it. But this is a big issue. I am seeing in, in my town, in my state, in Kerala, every day you can find trucks pushing solely waste from one town to another town. The people all come out and they fight and they send the truck backwards. It creates so much havoc in the places. And somebody start burning it, the whole city. Bombay had almost three months uh, fumes which was affecting the place. It has happened here also. So why should that natural process is that biomass will be converted to methane or carbon dioxide? That is a natural process. And we should respect that natural process and convert the entire biomass to methane. I mean, you talk about Germany. I went to Germany to understand how do they do it. So I went to a engineering company who does this thing, you know, they built a plant for uh, handling uh, municipal solid waste. First thing he said is, don't segregate. Get everything to me, to my plant. I will segregate in my plant. So he has built up facilities to segregate biomass, uh, I mean, uh, whether plastics or metals or glasses, so everything he, and ultimately he's doing bio conversion of municipal solid waste into gas, and the gas in the gas engine, he was, he built in his own town to demonstrate that it's possible, and he was selling two megawatt of power to the grid. Then they have, of course, places where farmers don't cultivate. So you have to incentivize farmers to cultivate. It is totally different in our country. They, they have what is called energy crop. They ask the farmers to cultivate and convert the product into power through bio route, anaerobic digestion of uh, the crop material along with, and there is a diary attached to it. And there is a lot of cow dung coming and they convert it into biogas. So it's possible to do it. So this is my another observation. My third observation is, yes, when you do a lot of things, there are technologies in the horizon. We should recognize that these technologies, unless we support, it may not develop into a commercial technology. So there has to be a mechanism by which the technologies in the horizon are identified, their merits are understood, and there should be a mechanism to support the R&D work, whether it is in the institutes or whether it is industry academic partnership, it can be done. So we did, uh, actually government has started, CSIR has started an industry academic research institute cooperation through what is called an Edmitly project, a new millennium initiative in licensing uh, technology. So we were a partner, we were an industrial partner for fuel cell development with uh, CSIR. We have just completed the project. Now we are in the process of commercializing it. So it's possible. 
I myself is collaborating with several American universities to develop technologies for Reliance. Why I'm going to states? Because there is no proper academic institution where research is uh, encouraged. Because the level of research in the institute is very, very low. And some of the countries are trying to encourage Indian universities to come up in the research level. For example, um, Royal Academy of Engineering, UK. They have instituted a process to encourage two-tier, second-tier institutions to uh, bring up a research culture in the institutes. So what they have to do is, one institute has to under identify industrial partner in India to identify a problem. And when you're handling the problem, you should have a partner in UK institute and a UK industrial partner. These four groups of people should work together to solve the problem. And they will fund. They will fund the entire initiative. So when I came to know about I started a project with one of the universities, one of the institutes in Navi Mumbai. And we got the entire thing approved and the grant is given. And we are trying to do a problem in our gasification technology. So it's possible. So what I say is the government, Indian government has to incentivize R&D in all the institutes. They have to make, it may be with the private or it can be with the private public partnership. And then there has to be some method of incentivizing research and developing the technology. As I talked about the battery, this is going to a breakthrough. In 10, ten years, I am telling you, the battery becomes so common in our transportation, in so many fields which we are using, so it will reduce our energy consumption. In the sense, the, the, the fossil fuel, oil, gas, and all will be reduced. Uh, transportation may entirely go to uh, battery-based uh, transportation. Then what will happen to all the planning which we do? So unless we take cognizance of the technology which is there and which is approaching us, we have to be very clear about what it happens if, if it becomes really true, then how are we going to uh, react to it? That is also required. Uh, these are a few of my observations. Let me see. One thing I am very much uh, like uh, the one of the, I think you talked about the uh, uh, lifestyle change, you know. Uh, Stan also mentioned about it. I referred it to, to my first talk. I am once again saying that it is not only all the time supplying to the demand. If you go that way, it will never end. The demand will rise. Why U.S. is having double the energy capita, per capita consumption of energy than Europe? How far different is their lifestyle? I do not know. It is simply a waste of energy. So it is not all the time meeting the demand. The demand itself has to be critically looked at. For that, it will require a different set of group, not only technologies of energy sitting together, there has to be town planners, transport experts. So different type of uh, disciplines have to come together. Because uh, if you look at the energy consumption in cities, you will always find they are taking the maximum portion of the energy which is produced. So what, who suffers? The poor people who are, who are not even having the facility of electricity in their village. So this disparity has to be seen and we have to change our lifestyles. Its habits have to be changed, cultures have to be changing, some more morals have to be there. The education has to come to make people understand how they should live, how their lifestyle has to change for the times. If you don't change the lifestyle and try to imitate the West or the US, then we are ever going to be in trouble. Or how much we make, how much we supply, the demand will never be met. These are my thoughts. Thank you very much for giving the opportunity. Thank you. <laughs>